Well, I wanted to ask you in the few minutes we have left, uh, if there were any interesting anecdotes you can share with us uh, from Batman v Superman or Mad Max. Batman v Superman, by the way, just got released to, to the home in the last day or two um, on Blu-ray and streaming and so on. Uh, so I'm curious to know, you know, if there were any interesting anecdotes you can share from your work on that movie, uh, Batman v Superman or Mad Max, Fury Road, or even the original Man of Steel, which the Batman v Superman was a sequel to that. Yeah, both of them had had a lot of fun experiences. We did a lot of recording, field recording on Man of Steel. It was, there was so many sounds that we had some stuff in the library, but we really wanted to to make it special. And uh, on that film, we went out and recorded uh, military vehicles. We recorded, there was so much uh, destruction um, in the film that we went out and recorded cement crashes. We actually went out uh, out in Fillmore, California here, and um, it was nice and quiet. And we found this guy that had sort of like all the, I don't know if you're familiar with these telephone poles that are are sort of made of cement and stone, um, sort yeah. of old school. Well, there was like a cemetery of, of these things, like 200 of them. <laughs> and we, we bought a K-rail, a freeway K-rail, construction K-rail, which was like 3,000 pounds, uh, got a forklift. And we went out and, uh, you know, raised the, raised the K-rail like, you know, 50 feet in the air and uh, dropped them on <laughs> the cemetery, the 200 different uh, cement street poles. Um, and then we started picking up the street poles and smashing those and dragging the K-rail over the mountain of uh, street poles. So we, we accumulated a, an amazing library of cement crashes and metal crashes and whatnot. But I think really the most fun recording episode we had, we since there was some military um, cooperation in Man of Steel, we were able to go out to Edwards Air Force Base and record um, a C-17, which was actually in that film. Uh, we got to plant 17 different microphones all over um, the C-17 and uh, we recorded from the cockpit to the cargo area all over. And it was just just amazing. Um, and in the meantime, uh, we also got to record some Black Hawk helicopters that were on at Edwards. And then in the Smallville battle, uh, you might notice that there were A-10 warthogs in there uh, participating as part of the military arsenal. And, and what, are the, that, what are those? I don't know that name. The A-10 Warthogs are, it's like an old uh, battle warcraft that was used in Vietnam, and they're super powerful. And um, they are, have- These are land vehicles? No, I'm sorry. These are jets, fighter jets. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. A-10 Warthogs. And they have cannons on them that um, it's just, it's stunning. That's the only place you can uh, see these things. They're at, at Montham Davis- uh, Air Force Base in Arizona. So they flew us there and they let us record their uh, testing uh, sessions. Um, we couldn't tell them like what maneuvers to do, but we got to record anything and everything that they did. Um, we had the advantage of, they had a couple of towers there, 50 foot towers. So we got on a 50 foot tower and <laughs> they let us have a pilot that was licensed to fly one of these beasts uh, as low as 50 feet. So we got really great close-up uh, recordings of these things. And, and you know, when you record a sound, you never can capture the full dynamics of, of the size and scope of that because the digital recorders just can't handle that kind of signal, you know. So you, you have to lower your recording signals accordingly. So, you know, it's just like looking at the Grand Canyon in person and looking at a picture of it. You know, you had mm. to be there. So, mm. but it was amazing hearing that cannon fire. It was so scary. I could not imagine being on the receiving end in battle of one of those A-10 warthogs. <laughs> oh my lord! We actually put a mic. We put a small hand, uh, a real cheap recorder, in the strafing pit, uh, so we could record the actual impacts of the rounds hitting the strafing pit. Wow! And, and the recording that we got was amazing. And we actually used that recording in the uh, Smallville battle 
where um, they're, the A-10 warthogs are firing and ripping up the, the streets, uh, the, you know, the asphalt's just sh being shredded. And yeah, uh, so I, we I remember actually, that in the movie, yeah. Yeah, it was great. The A-10 <laughs> warthogs, they couldn't really film them, so most of those were CG, believe it or not. If you, if you really? watch... Yeah, if you watch the movie, it looks real as hell, but um, most of them were CG, uh, so they could have control over that uh, as far as, you know, what they were doing maneuver-wise and whatnot. So it was really exciting get, getting to oh. go to those couple different military bases and, and being able to record such dynamic vehicles. Um, it, and you know, your, your comment about recording the, the sound of the plane flying just overhead and being so loud, you got to turn down the, the input level on the recorder makes me wonder if uh, using what we call, you know, high resolution audio at 24 bit depth instead of 16 bit, uh, which gives you greater dynamic range, if, if that affords you any advantage. I assume you probably record with 24 bit resolution when you're out in the field anyway, right? Absolutely. 24 bit all the time, sometimes up to 192 K. Um, mm. yeah. So we're into as high fidelity as possible. Sometimes, uh, 192 is a little overkill, but, um, a lot of recording, a lot of field recording we do at like 96 K and, mm -hmm. and not only for fidelity's sake, but it also affords us abil the ability to take those recordings, those such high fidelity recordings and process them. A lot of times if you have a lower resolution, uh, sound recording and you start to process it, it, you start to hear more artifacts uh, mm -hmm. sooner. So yeah. with these um, these type of recordings, uh, 96K or 192 recordings, it, you can really slow things down. Really, it's beautiful uh, with really clean sound with hardly any artifacts. So that's what we really take advantage of those um, higher sampling rates uh, and and really go to town with manipulation and processing. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, Radio Rod in the chat room is asking, uh, what plug-in do you prefer when doing ADR? I was made aware of some relatively new technology like Vocaline Pro that lines up the poor on-location sound with the new ADR recordings, which in theory should make lip sync perfect without having the actor have to be super great at ADR. Um, we endeavor on the ADR stage, if we have time, we try to do as many takes as it, as it does take to get good sync. I mean, our main goal is to get a great performance always, but, um, you know, the less editing that goes on, um, the better. And yes, uh, vocal line, uh, works, uh, I, I've, I'm not really too learned in all the different, um, you know, processors on that. In, the, in, in that line, because truthfully, we edit the ADR. We actually mm. physically edit it to match. Sometimes you use vocal line to get it close, but you know you don't want to. You try to use as little processing as possible um, in the process. At least I do. I, I'm more of a purist, and I'd rather my ADR editor physically edit the the line and put it in sync versus having. Um, but there's different there's different programs that stretch and pull um, audio to match the production track, and I'm mm -hmm. not super familiar with all of them. But Vocaline is very popular. 